So a big shout out to Dr. Musonda Mwilwa, who is a sickle cell warrior and a very big advocate for people living with sickle cell. So she asked me last week what I was going to do for sickle cell day on the channel. And I thought it was actually very important that I teach on the use of hydroxyurea in sickle cell patients. So grab a piece of paper and let's go. Hello and welcome to MK's Medical Review Series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we look at medical topics in depth. Today we're going to be looking at hydroxyurea in sickle cell patients. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such amazing content every time I post. Sorry about my voice, I'm still recovering from the terrible cold that I had. So, it is World Sickle Cell Day today on June the 19th, so please show some love to a sickle cell patient and learn about sickle cell today at least. You can watch a few sickle cell videos, I'll leave a few tagged at the end of this video that you can actually go check out on the channel. So remember that sickle cell itself is an autosomal recessive condition that's going to be characterized by the substitution that's happening on the beta a globin chain specifically the sixth position of the beta globin chain so what happens here is that you have a substitution of an amino acid so glutamate is substituted for valine now remember that glutamate is this amino acid that's hydrophilic it loves water and it's negatively charged so it means that it's on the surface of this beta chain of hemoglobin on the other hand valine is pretty much hydrophobic so you introduce something that's hydrophobic it means that it's going to shy away from the water and therefore change the shape of the hemoglobin thereby changing the shape of the sickle cell red blood cells so with this recurrent cycling the cells become less flexible and they can easily clog up blood vessels and they can result in different manifestations that we see in sickle cell and remember that the problem here is that you have this point mutation that's going to be occurring on chromosome 11 and you can have three main variants of the disease so you can have what is known as a sickle cell trait where someone has inherited one abnormal sickle cell gene from one of their parents and they have an, another normal hemoglobin gene. So these ones can actually have symptoms under extreme conditions like for example extreme living in high altitudes uh, where there is low partial pressure of oxygen. Or it could be sickle cell disease where these individuals have this abnormal sickle cell gene and they have another abnormal form of hemoglobin gene but not necessarily sickle cell gene. So for example HB uh, C. They could sometimes have a beta thalassemia gene. They could sometimes have an HBD or HBE combined with a sickle cell gene. Then in the most severe form of the condition, you have these two abnormal sickle cell genes, which we call sickle cell anemia. So one of the important drugs that we actually use in the management of sickle cell patients is hydroxyurea. Remember that this was approved by the FDA in 1998 for treatment of uh, clinically severe sickle cell anemia in adults and then in 2017 it was actually approved for treatment of sickle cell disease in children. The primary mechanism of this is not really quite known but what we actually think is that it actually induces the production of fetal hemoglobin. Remember fetal hemoglobin doesn't have that beta chain and fetal hemoglobin is actually much more resistant to this, uh, the cycling and the hemolysis that's taking place in these patients with sickle cell. So if you express a lot of these fetal hemoglobin then this will mean that this sickle cell patient will have less hospital admissions, they'll have less acute sickle cell pain crisis and when patients actually take this hydroxyurea it reduces the frequency of acute sickle cell pain and acute chest syndrome it also reduces the need for blood transfusions and hospitalizations with possible improved survival rates. Remember that hydroxyurea that is used to treat sickle cell patients can also be used for certain cancers and myeloproliferative disorders such as chronic myeloid leukemia though the doses that we usually give for this are at a much lower dose as compared to sickle cell. Now what are some of the indications of using sickle cell or rather indications of using hydroxyurea in an adult with sickle cell anemia? So, if someone has so if someone has three or more sickle cell associated moderate to severe pain crisis in a 12 month period 
and take note that what we term as a quote unquote a sick or so associated moderate to severe pain crisis is if they visit a hospital and they stay at that hospital or that medical facility for more than four hours and they actually require this parenteral administration of opiates or NSAIDs. Then also it could be sickle cell that's going to be associated with pain that interferes with their day-to-day -day life and their quality of life. Any history of severe or recurrent acute syndrome, any severe asymptomatic chronic anemia that's going to be interfering with their daily activities or quality of life. Then for children, remember now that it's recommended that children with sickle cell, regardless of the presentation, regardless of the severity, they must be started on hydroxyurea. And this is a decision that must be discussed with the parents. So it's indicated in infants that are older than 9 months to 42 months and children that are greater than 42 months and adolescents. So remember that in adults and children that have sickle cell disease and also have chronic kidney disease and those that are taking erythropoietin and they have anemia, then hydroxyurea can actually be added to the treatment regimen as this is going to be improving the anemia. In females that are pregnant or breastfeeding, remember we want to discontinue the hydroxyurea therapy because it has the potential to cause these birth defects. In patients that have a sickle cell, an abnormal sickle cell gene and a thalassemia gene or a sickle cell gene and HBC gene, who have recurrent uh, sickle cell associated pains that generally interfere with this daily activities or the quality of life, then we want to consult a sickle cell expert to consider them starting on hydroxyurea therapy. And in patients that are not demonstrating any clinical response to appropriate doses or uh, the duration of hydroxyurea, then we want to consult a sickle cell expert. Now, what's our treatment protocol? We want to consider certain things. Our pretreatment labs, we want to consider our pretreatment considerations, we want to look at the initial dosing, we want to look at the monitoring and the modification of the dose. Remember that the goal of treatment is pretty much to get a dose where you have this person tolerating the drugs very well and having minimal side effects and at the same time having mild myelosuppression. I'll tell you what mild myelosuppression is that we're going to be aiming for in sickle cell patients. So our pretreatment labs are going to include things like a full blood count with a differential reticulocyte count, HB electrophoresis or a high performance liquid chromatography, urea electrolytes, creatinine liver function tests such as bilirubin, liver enzymes such as ALT, a peripheral blood smear as well as a pregnancy test for women. And of course, baseline use of HBF or assessment of hemoglobin F actually should not even affect the decision for you to start the hydroxyurea therapy. And remember that both men and women of reproductive age must be counseled regarding the uh, need for contraception while they're taking uh, hydroxyurea. Now, what's our initial dose? So generally, we're going to be starting from 15 to 20 milligrams per kg per day. And generally for the teens and adults, we start at the lower end of the spectrum, while as for the younger patients, we can even start at a higher dose. So for the adults, we start at 15 milligrams per kg per day, and we usually round that up to the nearest 500 milligrams if we're using capsules that are 500 milligrams. Then we usually start at 5 to 10 milligrams per kg per day if a patient has a kidney disease, so you may use the 200, 300, or sometimes 400 milligrams capsules. For the infants and children, we started a higher dose of 20 milligrams per kg per day, and this can be compounded into a solution that gives you 100 milligrams of hydroxyurea per mil of solution. So remember that we want to use the same daily dosing whenever possible to make it simple for the patient to follow and to increase the adherence. And remember that additional dosing schemes such as telling the patient sometimes to take one capsule per day or alternating with two capsules per day can sometimes be used in uh, sickle cell patients and it can be used safely and effectively. Remember that we want to provide dosing instructions that are going to be including recommendations about the regular medication timings, the frequency, the adherence, as well as the potential side effects that they may face when they take this drug. So how do we monitor the dose and modify the dose? So generally we want to look at our full blood count and our differential count and the reticular side count ideally at least every four weeks so every month when you're adjusting the dose. So our aim is to get our absolute neutrophil count between 1.5 to 3 or at least greater than 2. However, in these younger patients a lower with a lower baseline, it, they can actually safely tolerate it uh, to as down low as 1.2. Five zero. Remember, the reason why we don't want you to drop below this is because we put them at risk of getting these severe bacteria infections with this myelosuppression. Then we want to keep the platelet count above 80,000 and the absolute reticulocyte count 100 to 200 
then if they have neutropenia or they have thrombocytopenia, you want to hold the hydroxyurea dosing, you want to monitor the full blood count weekly, and then of course when the blood counts recover, which is typically within a week, then we can restart the meta dose that's about 5 milligrams per kg per day, lower than the dose that they were given before they actually had those cytopenias. And of course, if the dose escalation is warranted based on clinical and lab findings and we want to increase by 5 milligrams per kg per day and we increase over 2 months. And of course, we give this until there's mild myelosuppression. So our absolute neutrophil count should be between 2 to 4. And this is going to be achieved and we shouldn't exceed a maximum of 30 to 35 milligrams per kg per day. And remember, once they actually reach this maximum tolerable dose, then we should monitor the FBC, the reticular head count, the platelet count every two to three months. We should measure the HBF for efficacy and assess, assess the renal and uh, hepatic toxicity every three to six months. Then remember that assessing for early treatment effects is going to be characterized by an increase in the mcv and the rdw along with a lower uh, absolute neutrophil count as well as absolute reticular site count we want to review the uh, peripheral smear and it's going to be showing this non-reticulocyte macrocytosis now patients must be reminded of the effectiveness of hydroxyurea depending on the adherence to the daily dose and remember if they miss any doses they shouldn't double up on the dose that has been missed and of course they should monitor you should monitor the mcv you should monitor the uh, hemoglobin f levels for evidence of any consistent or progressive laboratory response remember that a clinical response may sometimes take about three to six months and sometimes it may you may need to actually put the patient on six months of the maximum a tolerable dose that is required actually before you can actually discontinue the treatment due to treatment failure or whether it's due to lack of adherence or failure to respond to the therapy and remember a lack of increase in the mcv and or the hemoglobin f is not an indication to discontinue therapy and for patients who have clinical response long-term hydroxyurea therapy is indicated and hydroxyurea therapy should be continued even when the patient is admitted in the hospital or even when they are sick Contraindications include pregnancy and breastfeeding. Side effects are going to include fever, hyperuricemia, myelosuppression, thinning of the hair, mild hair loss. The fingernail beds may actually turn dark. They may have nausea. They may sometimes have some skin reactions. And what are some of the frequently asked questions? Remember, people ask, is it actually safe to take hydroxyurea for many years? So actually, it is safe. And many people have actually taken it for over 20 years. Even now, younger children can take it. The other frequently asked question is, does hydroxyurea actually cause cancer? So, so far, there hasn't been so many cases that have been reported or evidence that hydroxyurea can actually cause cancer in people that are living with sickle cell when taking the drug. And it has actually been safely used since the 1980s. And of course, can I still become pregnant while taking hydroxyurea? So if you're thinking of actually having a baby and you're taking hydroxyurea, you must talk to the doctor because hydroxyurea may actually increase the risk of birth defects so some women actually do choose to stop taking the hydroxyurea early in pregnancy and then continue it after the 29th week and the last question is what if i take hydroxyurea and it doesn't really work so remember don't be discouraged it does take time for it to work so give it at least one year and if but if you're experiencing side effects along the way please do talk to your doctor before you stop the medication and i will show this again because it's world sickle cell day and show some love to a sickle cell patient i really hope you enjoyed this video if you did consider subscribing to the channel hit the bell notification icon to receive notifications of such videos every time i post to zambia and beyond my name is dr moses kazevu until next time bye bye